All right, what's up, guys? Feeding information here. This is stock market news update for Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019. And this is the ninth video of the series. We have our five, it's actually six different companies right here. And of course, the music needs to be played. So we have Zynga, Intel, General Mills, AT&T, and Alibaba, and Tesla. Sorry. The General Mills one is going to be really short. That's why I did an extra one and just made it six today. But let's start. So we have Zynga data breach exposed 200 million words with friends players. That's a lot of freaking people. More than 200 million players of the popular video games words with friends and draw something had their login information stolen. Publisher Zynga announced there was a data breach of account login info for Draw Something and Words with Friends players on September 12th. Now a hacker has claimed responsibility for the breach. A hacker that goes by the name Genostic Players said they stole data from over 218 million Words with Friends players accounts. CNET, CNET wrote, the hacker accessed a database that included data from Android and iOS players who installed the game before September 2nd. The hack exposed users' names, email addresses, login IDs, some Facebook IDs, some phone numbers, and Zynga account IDs, according to Hacker News. It did not include financial information, Zynga said, adding that it has already taken steps to protect users' accounts from invalid logins. If the company believes their information was exposed, it noted that some users were required to change their passwords. Cyber attacks are one of the unfortunate realities of doing business today, the company said on a support page. Especially with the way technology is growing, Zynga is one of the most successful mobile game companies today with hits like Farmville, Zynga Poker, Mafia Wars, and Cafe World. Mobile apps have become frequent hacking targets last week. Food delivery service DoorDash said almost 5 million accounts were accessed in a data breach. After the video I did yesterday, guys, I wonder if Call of Duty is going to get hacked relatively soon. That'd be interesting. Anyways, though, on to the next article. We have Intel. I don't know why they're reloading. That's very strange. Intel launches powerful Core X series processors at drastically lower prices. Look at these bad boys. Come on. You, you can do it, Paige. Two years after Intel launched its ultra high-end Skylake X, X series gaming processors at stratospheric prices, brother, can you spare $2,000? Ha 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 ha. The company has announced the next-gen Cascade X chips at more affordable prices if by affordable, you mean the price of an Apple iPhone 11 Pro. Indeed, compared to its $1,999 predecessor, Intel's new 18-core Core i9-9980, I hate the way they word these, XE Extreme Edition chip is downright cheap at $979. It's still too rich for you. There's hope. Intel has priced its 10-core Core i9-9980. 10,900X chip at a mere $590. Both sound pretty expensive to me, but I guess it's like buying a, a brand new phone, right? It's worth it. Intel says its new Cascade Lake X processors will go on sale in November after originally promising the Cascade Lake X chips in October. That's the same month AMD plans to launch its new Thread Ripper chips. I love that name. Incidentally, we still don't know how much the new Threadripper chips will cost or whether AMD will respond to Intel's moves with its own price cuts, but it's clear that competition is beginning to help lower prices at the high end of the PC market. All right, if you guys want to go ahead and pause the video and check this out, feel free. It's just I feel like it's so much extra to read through, like to read through for no reason, but it's basically just Cascade Lake X speeds and feeds, so it's just showing you a lot of statistics and you know, things like that. Come on. All these ads, yo. It makes the page not load. Or I, I guess scroll down is my point. All right. That's probably enough, though, seeing as how it's still loading pretty slow. So now, now let's move on to our really quick article of General Mills. General Mills debuts new toasted coconut Cheerios. That sounds delicious. I love chocolate with coconut, so I feel like Cheerios with coconut would just be amazing. So toasted coconut Cheerios feature whole grain oats with the nutty flavor of coconut. You can find limited edition toasted coconut Cheerios at retailers nationwide for a limited time only. In addition to new toasted coconut Cheerios, General Mills is welcoming back a pair of seasonal fan favorite cereals. Sugar Cookie Toast Crunch offers holiday flavor to Cinnamon Toast Crunch fans, while Cinnamon Vanilla Lucky Charms, God, that sounds like 
a hell of a stomach ache. Feature marshmallow shaped snowmen, snowballs, and snowflakes and seasonal spices. And here's some nutrition facts. You could probably go to your local Walmart, I'd guess, right now and get this. I may do it. I'm not sure yet, but quick article. Next up, we got AT&T. This one is a really interesting article. I think you guys are going to like it. Let me tell you guys first, though. We're going to come back to it just in case. But what is EPIDA? This ties in with the article, so I didn't mean to go down, but... Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization is what EPIDA is. It it is a measure of a company's operating performance. Essentially, it's a way to evaluate a company's performance without having to factor in financing decisions, accounting decisions, or tax environments. Now, that begged me the question, what is a good EPIDA? What is considered a healthy EPIDA? The enterprise value to EPIDA ratio varies by industry. As of June 2018, the average EPIDA for the S&P was 12.98. As a general guideline, an EPIDA value below 10 is commonly interpreted as healthy and above average by analysts and investors. So remember that. Or pause the video real quick and remember this. Because it's probably said like 40 times, I feel like. The Wall Street Journal reported that AT&T might be considering selling its underperforming. It just like triggers me when they pop up. It's underperforming DirecTV satellite TV operations, particularly due to pressure from activist hedge fund Elliott Management, which wants the company to streamline its business. The, co- the company is contemplating multiple options that include spinning off DirecTV into a separate public company or selling it to rival Dish Network, while AT&T acquired DirecTV at an enterprise value of $67 billion, we believe that it could be worth much less at the moment. In this analysis, we break down the potential value of the U.S. operations, which we believe would be the largest of the, di- of the divestment, considering that the Latin American operations, now called Vir- Virio, have actually grown in recent years. We also compare the key metrics and valuation with DirecTV's metrics as a standalone company in 2014, the year prior to its merger with AT&T. Whew. DirecTV's subscriber base has declined from 20.4 million in 2014 to 19.2 million in 2018 and further declines as expected this year. DirecTV's satellite sub- subscriber base in the U.S. has declined from 20.4 to 19.2 million in 2018. The company's over-the-top offering, DirecTV, now has grown from 0.3 million subscribers in 2015 to 1.6 million in 2018. We estimate that EPIDA for DirecTV U.S. will decline from 7 billion in 2014 to this year 6.3 billion in 2019. DirecTV's U.S. revenue stood at $26.2 billion in 2014, with its company-wide EPIDA margin standing at 26%, implying an EPIDA of about $7 billion from the U.S. DirecTV revenues this year stood at $27.5 billion per our estimates, including the DirecTV Now streaming service launched in 2016. We estimate that margins have declined to 23%, translating into an EPIDA of about $6 billion. $0.3 billion. We estimate the company's DirecTV revenues using DTV subscriber mix of 85% of total video subscribers and estimated total video revenues of about $32.3 billion. We estimate 2019 margins for DirecTV US as 23%, considering the entertainment segment, which includes DirecTV operations, had an EPIDA margin of about 21% in 2018. I need some water real quick. Anyways, moving to our next article. We now have Alibaba, one of my all-time favorite stocks right now and definitely one of my top investments. Why cloud computing will be a key revenue driver for Alibaba. Shares of China's technology giant Alibaba have largely outperformed the market this year before a recent pullback that still has left the stock up 20% year to date. But what has driven the company's stock higher? Alibaba continues to post solid results despite a sluggish domestic economy and the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China. Here we're going to look at Alibaba's fastest growing business segment and why it will be a key revenue driver going forward. That's such a beautiful picture. The huge market opportunity for Alibaba. We can see below how cloud computing revenue outpaced gains from the company's other business segments, such as core commerce and digital media and entertainment in fiscal 2019, which ended in March. So here you go by the segments. We have 34.1 billion to then 48.2 billion, which is 41.2% growth. 
However, you can look down below, you have cloud computing going from 2.1 to 3.7 billion, which is a 72.4% growth. Now, obviously one is a lot more billions than the other, but it just goes to show you how much faster it is really growing. And honestly, innovations and initiatives, 32.5%. That's pretty impressive, honestly. It's, it's very tiny, but it's still impressive. It's just a random one that's growing. The digital media could do better, but I mean, 15%, that's still better than a lot of, of companies out there segment. So Alibaba will be banking on cloud sales to help drive growth going forward. In the June quarter, the company's cloud computing revenue maintained its rapid expansion, growing 66% year over year to $1.1 billion and accounting for 7% of sales. The growth was driven by an increase in average revenue per customer. The company launched over 300 new products and features in the second quarter with a focus on delivering value-added services to expand its customer base and increase enterprise engagement. Management aims to expand market leadership by increasing investments in research and development as 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 well as investing heavily to attract the best human capital. In fact, in fiscal 2019, Alibaba increased its R&D spending by 64.5%. Now, just like you would guess, it does mean research and development. R&D spending is research and development spending. And they increased that by 64.5%, guys. That's pretty impressive. Those expenses accounted for 9.9% of sales in 2019, up from 9.1% of sales in 2018. Alibaba is also targeting growth by expanding the SAAS software as a service offerings. It wants to work in collaboration with SAAS partners and build an ecosystem to provide exceptional services to enterprises. China's cloud computing market accounts for over 25% of the global total and continues to grow at a rapid pace. According to market research firm Canalyst, China's cloud infrastructure services market grew by 58% year over year to 2.3 billion in the second quarter of 2019. Now we got some competition from tech giants. Bring it on, right? Alibaba led China's cloud market with a share of 43% at the end of the second quarter. Tessin and Baidu held 17.4% and 8.7% shares of the market, respectively. Globally, Alibaba is competing with tech heavyweights like Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft. Gartner previously estimated Alibaba's LIAAS, sorry, infrastructure as a service public cloud revenue grew at 92.6%, which was the highest among top players in 2018, besting impressive figures from Amazon, 26.8% up, Microsoft, 61% up, and Alphabet, 60% up. One reason Alibaba will continue to grow cloud sales at an inviolable pace is due to its traction among China's top companies. At the end of 2018, over 40% of China's top 500 companies, over 50% of the country's listed companies, were on Alibaba Cloud. The company has successfully established itself as the primary public cloud platform for businesses across all industries in China, and importantly, 80% of the region's startups. The verdict? China's 800 million internet users and the rapid transition to 5G will result in an exponential data growth that will need to be stored in a secure environment. These tailwinds will drive demand for cloud services, providing a huge opportunity for Alibaba and its peers. China's cloud computing market is estimated to grow from 14 billion in 2018 to three years from now, 25 billion in 2022. According to China Daily, Almost there, guys. Though the cloud computing segment is still unprofitable, the company will aim to see bottom line contributions from this segment in the near future. Investors need only look at Amazon Web Services, or as we love to call it, AWS, which made up less than 15% of revenue, but 69% of total operating profit for the e-commerce giant in the most recently reported quarter. Alibaba will look to replicate its rival's success, turning the cloud into one of its key profit drivers as it benefits from economics from from economies of scale, sorry, with demand for cloud services in China and other Asian economies growing, the segment will make up an increasing share of Alibaba's sales. And if profitability can expand in tandem with the top line, the stock still has plenty of room to to run. Oof. All right. Tesla is the last article, guys. I like never talk about Tesla. So this is going to be fun because I do love Elon Musk. He's a great, great, intelligent individual. Tesla said on Wednesday that it cranked out a record number of vehicles in the third quarter, underscoring the recent success of efforts to boost international deliveries and incentivize customers to purchase the electric vehicles. The Paleo Alto, California-based company, delivered 97,000 cars in the three months ending in September, topping a previous all-time high hit during the quarter prior. The comprised 
This comprised 79,600 deliveries for Tesla's biggest selling Model 3 sedans, as well as 17,400 combined deliveries for Tesla's Model S and Model X SUVs. That compares to 87,048 Tesla produced in the second quarter. Ahead of results, Wall Street analysts were largely anticipating between 95,000 and 100,000 deliveries for the quarter. Shares of Tesla fell more than 5% after hours of 4 point of 456 p.m. because it missed by 3% on disappointment that production failed to clear the top range of estimates. Ahead of official results, Tesla CEO Elon Musk said in a company-wide email, the company had a shot at delivering more than 100,000 vehicles during the quarter. The publication had also reported that Tesla was allowing its sales team to offer discounts as well as other incentives like free supercharging to help boost deliveries through the end of the quarter. The big question now will be whether Tesla is able to translate these results into profits. In the second quarter, Tesla posted then record quarterly deliveries of 95,356 vehicles, helping drive a 60% year-over-year increase in revenue. But the company posted a much wider than expected loss over the same period, with its net loss attributable to common stockholders totaling $408 million. At the time, Musk said he expected Tesla would only break even for the third quarter, pivoting to focus on continuous volume growth, capacity expansion, and cash generation. As a primary aim, earlier in the year, Musk had anticipated that the company would be profitable in all quarters going forward. Musk in July has also reiterated guidance for total deliveries to come in between 360,000 and 400,000 for the full fiscal year, a level which has come closer within reach after the solid third quarter results. So guys, now you can go ahead and pause the video if you like and take a look at these last bit of quotes and stuff by just analysts and just like, it's kind of just random people. It's like four or five different people just talking about this scenario. But I feel it's kind of pointless to read because I've read what they already kind of have said. Now they're just giving their opinions. So yeah, feel free. But that is it, guys. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to smash that like button. And I would appreciate it if you subscribed because there will be more content like this every day, as well as portfolio updates. I'll probably be doing one either this Friday or next Friday. And of course, I, I want to do some random videos where I'm just kind of like, you know, y'all are getting to know me better. Um, you'll see what I mean with my next video. I'm going to do it tonight. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Feed you information out. Have a great day, guys.